go back to your your Bibles once more and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is our scripture reading for our sermon this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Our sermon will pick up with verse 10 since we left off in verse 9, but I will read the whole chapter to give us a bit of the context. Deuteronomy 11, I remind you again that this is God's word, and so let us give our attention to its reading. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And consider today, since I am not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, consider, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm. His signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land. And what, did, and what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots. How he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you. And how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. And what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place. And what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, son of Reuben. How the, Lord, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord that he did. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you are going over to possess, and that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you are entering to take possession of it is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it, like a garden of vegetables. But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and, turn, and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways and holding fast to him, and the Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the, to the Lebanon, and from the river to the, the river Euphrates to the western sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread, as he promised you. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Gebal. Are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, 
toward the going down of the sun in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the oak of Moreh. For you are to cross over the Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And when you, take, when you possess it and live in it, you shall be careful to do all the statutes and the rules that I am setting before you today. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come this morning to continue our study, to continue our study, looking together at the book of Deuteronomy. We are about one-third of the way through the book after today. We have covered a great deal so far. We have covered the history, that is, the time that Moses recounts the people of Israel from the opening of the book all the way through chapter 4, recounting their deliverance, their wanderings, and their success in battle. Then we consider the sum of God's law. That declaration of the ten words, as they were called, or the ten commandments, as we call them. They would be those that would guide God's people. They would be those that the people were accountable to as they served the Lord. And from there we've been looking at the length, the exposition of the first commandment. And there are more expositions to come as Moses opens up the law of God for us. Chapter by chapter. But this first commandment, you shall have no other gods besides me. We have learned that it can also be said and summarized. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. As Jesus said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And we have learned that its application can be summed up quite simply. Trust only the Lord. Serve only the Lord. It is simply summed up, but it is not simple in practice. For we have learned as we've studied together the book of Deuteronomy that what Israel struggled with, they happen to be our struggles as well. We are prone to trust ourselves. We are prone to look to our own abilities, our own might, our own resources, and to take pride in those things rather than trusting in the Lord. We are prone to look at our own righteousness rather than the righteousness of Christ. This is Israel's problem, and this is our problem as well. And so our study of Deuteronomy, I hope, has been helpful as it has pointed us time after time to the flaw, to the sin that is inherent, that we all wrestle with, we all struggle with, even as it points us to Christ, and even as it lays out for us the way in which we are to walk in this life. Speaking of that last week, that's what we looked at. We asked the question, what does God require? Actually, that's the question that Moses asks the people. And we learned last week that we are to look to the word of God, that it is to be that which shapes how we think. It is to be that which, that which shapes what we are to expect. And it's a word that calls for a response. A response in faith. A response in holiness. And central to that, we saw was that we were to love the Lord. And by the way, this is a constant refrain throughout Deuteronomy. It's one of those parts that gets kind of surprising to people as they read through Deuteronomy, maybe aware, aware of it for the first time, expecting a book of law. And yes, there is much law in it, but at the center of that law is the call to love the Lord. The laws were just an outworking of how one is to love the Lord. Think about a marriage ceremony and the vows that are spoken to have and to hold, to cherish, to keep, all of the things that we speak of, to obey, to care for, all of those things. We can sit back and just look at that one snippet and say how legalistic marriage is. We know that marriage has at its core the call of a husband and wife to love one another. And so God gives himself to his people. And in Deuteronomy we see that we as his people are to give ourselves to the Lord. And this, by the way, is the message of the Bible. God desires a people. A people 
who will worship Him faithfully. A people who will inherit a place. A people who will be holy. See, this is the message. All the way from the garden in Genesis, all the way to the last garden in Revelation 21 and 22, the message, the story of the Bible is the same. God desires a people who will be to Him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is what He says in Exodus 19 and verse 6 when He brings Israel out of Egypt. And so we see that this is the story throughout Scripture. And we'll understand that more and more and more as we study Deuteronomy together. Well, this week our passage continues, and it's an interesting uh, sort of movement. We're coming to the end of the exposition of the first commandment. And so Moses brings it all to a head, all to a point, all to a question, all to a blessing or a curse. We're going to hear this also repeated throughout Scripture. Perhaps most familiar to us is in Joshua 24. Choose this day whom you will serve. There are so many homes that have that embroidered in place there. And if you have that, that's wonderful, that's fine. May it always remind you that God calls His people to Himself. But may it also remind you, because we cannot simply look at that and say, well, it's simple, we just choose not to sin. It's simple, we just choose blessing instead of curse. Because the message of Scripture is over and over and over again that left to ourselves, we would choose the curse. We need one who is greater than Moses. We need one who is greater than Joshua. And so every time this question is put before us in the scriptures, it's part of a bigger story driving to its final conclusion in Jesus Christ. And so we see this morning, this in our text. How will they live when they come into the land? How are they to live when they come into the land? They are to live in such a way that shows that God is their King and their Lord. They are to live in such a way that they choose the blessing and not the curse. Let's see how this unfolds this morning in our text. And we'll say more about its place in the story of Scripture as we go through it and come to the end. We begin with the blessing of the land. The blessing of the land. Now, the land of Canaan, the promised land, it was a glorious land. And Moses actually makes a comparison with it to Egypt. And remember, Egypt was the place that they had come out of. It was the place of bondage and slavery. But it's not the bondage and slavery versus the freedom that Moses is drawing on this time. He's actually looking at how things were cultivated. He's looking at how, they, how the plants were watered. It's a, very, it's a very basic kind of idea. In Egypt, there was the Nile. And every year, or a couple of times a year, the Nile would flood. And as it would overflow, they built irrigation works that would go out to all the various places that they needed to water in order to grow their crops. This is how they did it. But God says that's not the way it's going to be in the promised land. The promised land is going to be provided with water directly from heaven. Now we read this and we think, so it's going to rain. Big deal. What does that matter? But all of the language here in this chapter and throughout the discussion of the promised land is actually an echo. It's an echo of another garden. It's an echo of a garden that God watered abundantly and that there were trees for the taking, all except one tree. And that's the Garden of Eden. And so the language of Canaan is meant to echo the language of Eden. It's meant to remind them that this is a land that the Lord loves. A land that God cares for. You see, it is true that God, by His common grace, had cared for Egypt. It is true that God provides the rain for the just and the unjust, and the sun for the just and the unjust, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. But He says here, of the land, of the promised land, of the land of Canaan, that He cares for this land. That the eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it. Now as an aside, certainly something worthy of our consideration, but just not this morning, is the reality that that, man, that, the, that that meant that the eyes of the Lord were upon it even prior to that. And that the eyes of the Lord had cared for that land in preparing it for His people. And so here we see God in His love caring for them 
Yes, caring for the whole world, but caring particularly in a particular way for this land. Drive home the point that the land of Canaan was actually a kind of garden of Eden. You see this, and it's linguistic throughout the Old Testament, but let me just point you to one passage in particular. It's in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, which if you're familiar with that, is actually speaking of judgment on the land. And so it's coming in the exile at the end. But this is what it says. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. That was the land of Canaan. It was the Garden of Eden. And behind them, a desolate wilderness. Speaking of those locusts that would consume the land, that would take away all of the blessings because of the people's disobedience, because of what's placed here before us in Deuteronomy chapter 11. The blessing and the curse for Israel. We see this even in our text in chapter verse 13. If you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, He will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil, and He will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. The blessings here are connected in a sense, to their obedience. But they have in view their enjoyment and provision from God's hand. And yet again, we hear the echo. We hear the echo of the Garden of Eden. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely eat die. You see, Israel, in the land, they are a kind of echo. They are a the different ways of, the, to explain this. Uh, I, I mentioned in the past that Calvin would talk about Moses narrowly and Moses broadly. Broadly speaking, he would include the, the, the ceremonial laws, the sacrifices for sins, but narrowly he was focused upon the command of obedience to remain in the land. Others have used different kinds of languages. Uh, Charles Hodge of Princeton has talked about a national covenant versus a salvific covenant. Some have talked about the horizontal versus the vertical. Language like recapitulation have been used. I just like to talk about it as a retelling of the story. It's a retelling of the story. Adam. The man created by the Lord, placed in a good land, provided with everything he needed, and told simply to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Israel, the new Adam, placed in a good garden land, given everything and told that everything will be provided so long as they are obedient to the command of God. It's an echo. It's a retelling of a story. And it has a purpose. It has a point. Because it continues to remind us of our failure that we cannot attain to that glorious good land on our own. And so we see that the land is not like, not like Egypt. It's a land that God loves. We see that they are called to be careful in their occupancy. Look at verse 16. Take care, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Now here, we're beginning to get a connection between the first and the second commandments. But that second commandment will be fully exposited in the chapters to come. But here, we must understand that the love of the Lord and the service or the worship of the Lord, they go hand in hand. It's not as though we can say, oh, I love God and therefore I can worship Him however I want. God is clear that we are to serve and to honor Him and Him alone. And He lays out the way in which we are to approach Him, the way in which we are to draw near to Him. And the stakes could not be higher for Israel. For if they turn aside, if their hearts are careless and they are deceived, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. And He will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly. 
of the good land that the Lord is giving you. This is the danger that they would face, and it is the area that they are most likely to fall. But note, it wasn't simple outward obedience that the Lord called for. You can imagine in marriage counseling, a husband simply saying, I have not broken any of my vows. I have provided everything. And a wife saying, but I, you don't love me. These things go together. It wasn't simple outward obedience that the Lord called for. It wasn't only external, but it was internal. The Lord was to be loved by Adam, loved by Israel. Their heart was the focus. For as Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And is this that defiles a person? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, and so on. The response then to their covenant faithlessness would be God's anger. And this anger would be shown in an opposite way that his favor is shown. No rain, no fruit, death. Ultimately, the land would reject them. Just as Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, so Israel would be exiled from the promised land. They would lose their garden of Eden. So we see the blessing of the land. We see the call to obedience. And this is what already started in the previous verses. Continues here as the main theme. We read here in verse 18. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. They were to have God's word filling their heart. Remember again that the heart is the focus. Remember how Moses said to Israel not long ago in our text to circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and to be not stubborn. Their attention was fixed often on what they needed to eat in order to prosper. God reminds them of the importance and the centrality of his words. Remember in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In this way, then, Israel is warned against a very common practice or a very common error of seeking the gifts and not the one who gives. Of seeking creation and not the creator. This would always be before them. Would they look to those things that God had commanded them not to take? And would they see it and desire it? Thinking that God was being cruel in keeping it back from them. Again, hear the echo from Eden. When Eve looks at the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she doesn't say, oh, that looks terrible. No, it looks good. And she began to entertain this idea that God was holding something back from them. Something good. Something delicious. But there's God with his rules holding them back. You see, what's going on here in the garden, or in, in the land of Canaan, which is an echo of the Garden of Eden, is that, is that man, is that Adam, is once more being tested. Would Israel, the new Adam, when they hear the word of God and live by those words, when they lay up those words in their heart. He commands them to have the law not only impressed upon their minds, but to embrace it with sincere affection. John Calvin, he comments, he says, that doctrine is not an affair of the tongue, but of the life. It is not apprehended by the intellect and memory merely, but is received only when it possesses the whole soul and finds its seat and habitation in the inmost recesses of the heart. And so Israel is to have their heart filled with God's word. They're to have their eyes fixed upon God's word. And again, these are actually repeats of what we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Remember, we talked then that it wasn't about trying to make this giant thing, this big phylactery, and that would make one look holy and good and righteous. It's to break everything that we've been talking about thus far. 
It wasn't about making these giant ornamental bracelets so that everybody could see just how holy you were as you were weighed down with the Word of God upon your hands. No. It was a reminder that they were to have them in their mind. They were to have them before their eyes at all times. It's not about a show. It's about the heart. They were also to have lives that followed God's word. Uh, in verse 19, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you are walking by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise again. This is a repetition of what we've seen in Deuteronomy 6. I said more of it on it then. You can listen to that sermon if you'd like. But, but it's not just about a Sunday school class. It's, it's a continual conversation with children such that parents impress upon them their own love of the Lord. It's not forcing it upon the children, but neither is it sitting back and letting them find their own way with regard to God's Word. It's a faithful instruction that takes place day by day, oftentimes, yes, in family worship, but not just in family worship. Remember, parents, that your children are watching you at all times. So we have a mindfulness of that. And God calls us to that. We see also the promise of God's word. And this is where, where God begins to tell them what they would receive. They would have multiplied days, safe days, successful days. You can read those there in the text. Verse 21, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land. This is an echo, if you will, of that fifth commandment that we reflected upon this morning. That it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. That your days may be prolonged in the land. Clearly here in this text, we see a principle of reaping and sowing. As Job himself knew, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And so we see the call to obedience. Focused upon God's Word, hearts filled with God's Word, eyes fixed upon God's Word, lives following after God's Word, focusing on the promise of God's Word, and those multiplied, safe, and successful days. And this is, by the way, what would ground the promises of like Second Chronicles 7, when God says, When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Note the context. The context is there in the land of Canaan, in the Garden of Eden. Look, the context is with the new Adam and his obedience. And here God in His mercy provides a way for repentance because Israel would fail over and over and over and over again. The key to passages like that is that they are grounded in the Mosaic Covenant with the Old Testament saints. Now it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to us. We want to avoid the mistake of saying that it applies to any other nation. In other words, by approaching Deuteronomy as we have and taking the care to understand it as part of this bigger story, it should protect us. I say should, doesn't always, from making the mistake of assuming that these are promises to America or any other nation. Because where we are in the story is that we are not the new Adam. The second and last Adam has come. And He has secured for us that glorious promised land that is flowing with milk and honey, that has trees that are watered, that has two trees of life, and that has the leaves for the healing of the nations, the new creation that is promised to us in Revelation 21 and 22. And so it reminds us where we are now in the story. We're in the wilderness. We're in Babylon. We're waiting for Jesus to return. And until he does, we continue to trust in his promises and his goodness and to focus upon his word because we are that people that God has desired. We are that people that God has been building, that God has been calling to himself all the way back in the Garden of Eden through the promise 
land of, e of Israel all the way into the exile and beyond, God has called to himself a people. We're going to talk about that tonight. The church, the Israel of God, called to be faithful before him, to trust him, to love him, to be that holy people. But looking back at our text, we see that the days are also successful days. Verse 24. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. When I read that, I heard another echo. An echo of the promise. Remember when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. And the promise was that God would raise up a deliverer. Would raise up the seed of the woman who would crush, who would tread upon the seed of the serpent. Well, here we find the promise given to the next Israel. Given to, are given to the next Adam that God would conquer, that the enemies would be put down, that they would wait and trust in the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. There's the call to ob obedience. And that brings us then to the point of this text, the blessing and the curse. Verse 26, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and and a curse. Note, it's in the singular. It's not a pick and choose. It's interesting. It's not a be 50% obedient and receive 50% blessing. It is a blessing and a curse. Choose this day whom you will serve. God makes very clear, if you do not obey the commandments, of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. The stipulations are clear, obedience or disobedience. They are explained to them so that they would know them. They are confirmed so that they might believe them. And he charges them to choose which of them they would have. And it goes on. And it talks about how this covenant is then to be ratified. Now this language here, it's, we'll come to it in time if, if God willing we get to, to the book of Joshua and I get a chance to preach Joshua. But in Joshua, we find this instruction fulfilled or followed through. Here in verses 29 and 30, where he says you're going to take the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. And in Deuteronomy 27, as we'll see, he actually assigns the various tribes that are supposed to represent those things. And in Joshua chapter 8, we read of Joshua fulfilling the command here for the, bless, for the blessing and for the curse. As Israel enters into the promised land and they enter into this covenant with the Lord. They would go into the land. They would take possession of it. And our text ends, and when you possess it, and live in it. You shall be careful to do all the statutes and the rules that I am setting before you today. This covenant is a reminder of God's faithfulness, of God's goodness, and of God's mercy. For Israel did not deserve to enter the promised land. Remember, they had turned aside from the Lord from following Him even before they got to Mount Sinai. We focus our attention on that glorious moment of the golden calf. There's Moses on Mount Sinai receiving the commandments and there's Aaron making golden calves before which they are bowing and partying. And we look at that and say, see, they failed. But even before they got to Mount Sinai, they began to grumble against the Lord. They began to complain that they didn't have food. They didn't have water. I mean, they barely exited Egypt and got to the Red Sea. That they accused Moses of bringing them out because there weren't enough graves in Egypt to do a mass burial in the sea. Israel is not a picture of covenant faithfulness. They are a reminder to us of what God requires. And ultimately, ultimately, what our great need is. Because remember, it's never about taking Israel out and putting ourselves in their place. If you think that after walking through the desert 
for days and days and days without water that you wouldn't grumble. This quarantine has actually proved otherwise, right? <laughs> if you think for a moment that you would not have participated in the golden calf ceremony, your own heart knows otherwise as it is pulled away from the Lord in so many different ways and at so many different times. How many of you have promised the Lord that you were going to avoid a certain sin only to find yourself buckling to temptation in the moment it presents itself again? We all fall far short. The story of Israel is a reminder to us that God requires righteousness, that God requires holiness, but it is never about us putting ourselves in the place of Israel. For Israel is the new Adam, but they are not the last Adam. They are not the faithful Adam who would secure the blessings for God's people. Israel, beloved, reminds us of our great need, that we might turn to the Lord and that we might trust in Him For this whole discussion, this whole promise, or the, this whole requirement, not only points us back to, to Adam in the garden, but forward to Christ. He is the one who comes, and He is the one who keeps God's law perfectly. Yes, this story reminds us that God is faithful. He always keeps His promises. For He held the land of Canaan for the people of Israel even though they failed, and even though they would fail. But their failure would ultimately push them out of the land, into exile, just as Adam's failure pushed him out of the Garden of Eden. But the Apostle Paul reminds us that all of this points us to Christ. For he is that offspring that was promised in, in Genesis 3 and in Genesis 12. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, Jesus is that offspring. He is the one who is obedient and faithful. He is the one who secures for us a promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. A land that is greater than any earthly Eden or any earthly Canaan ever could be. For it is the new creation. And just as God held the land of the Canaanites in reserve for his people as their earthly inheritance, so he holds in reserve for those who are in Christ an eternal heavenly possession. That new creation that can never fade, that can never fall, that we can never lose. You see, that's the danger when we read Deuteronomy and other passages that put before us a choice. If we place ourselves in there, then we think and we might wonder and we would be right and we might lose it. Israel lost it, and we are no better. But the promise is that one greater than Israel, one greater than Moses, than Joshua, than Abraham, than Adam, one greater has come, and he has been faithful and obedient to the covenant, and he has secured for you, beloved, an eternal inheritance. One that cannot be lost. Hear the words of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Beloved, Moses could only point Israel to Canaan and to the need for obedience. But Jesus is a greater mediator. And he can point you, not just to the heavenly promise, but he can keep you for that heavenly promise. Do you see why the author of Hebrews says that Moses was a faithful servant in God's house, but Christ is a faithful servant over God's house? He is the faithful Son. It is to Him and for Him that all of the mercy and all of the blessings and all of the glory belongs. 
And by God's grace, we are being kept for something even greater than that land of Canaan that was promised in Deuteronomy 11. We are being kept for what Deuteronomy 11 pointed to, even as it reminds us of our need for righteousness, our need for obedience. It's ours in Jesus Christ.